Our Heavenly Father, thank you for waking us up this morning, for bringing us here. I pray that we will just not warm the pews, but that our hearts will be open to what you want to teach us this morning. Send us the Holy Spirit, and may you abide in our midst. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here back at UT Pines. One leg less than last year, but it's healing. Getting me to sit on this stool and speak is about equivalent of you telling your two-year-old to sit perfectly motionless for the next hour. If you've seen me speak, I tend to walk around, and the reason for that is the way I think is to pace. So you can pray for me that the Lord can flash uh, thoughts into my mind even though I'm not pacing, right? (laughs) Um, Why are we here? We talked about that last night. I'd like to ask another question, though. Why are we still here? Why are we here at this conference? Well, we'd like to learn more about true education. Why are we still here on this earth? Peter tells us we can hasten the coming of the Lord. How are we going to do that? Praying? Lord, come soon? Well, yes. But he's also given us a work to do, right? We have a job to do. Go preach the gospel, he said. Those were the last words that he left with us, his followers. Saying, spread the news. And I believe it's going to take an entire generation to finish the work on this earth. A generation that sets the world aside and focuses on accomplishing the job that the Lord has given us. And that's what we're going going, to discuss this morning. Before we get into it, would you bow your heads with me just one more time? Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here and study into the principles of true education. Lord, we need your help to understand these concepts, though. They are truths that you have given, and only you can help us understand them correctly. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon each mind here. May we, may you clear away the fog of our own understanding and grant us a special measure of your understanding. And I pray that you'll speak through me. May, may I only share your words. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> TED Talk, your brain plus the cloud equals superhumans. Are you excited? <laughs> I hope not. But this is what they are saying. Google engineer Ray Kurzweil predicts nanocomputers connected to the cloud will be implanted in our brains by 2030. That's only 12 years away. Nanocomputers implanted in our brains that connect to the cloud will usher in a new era of critical thinking and human advancement. I'm not sure I would call it advancement. Google's director of engineering predicts in a TED Talk, Ray Kurzweil says that by the 2030s, nanobots embedded through the bloodstream into our brains will create hybrid minds that combine the current power of our brain with the almost limitless processing capacity of cloud-based computers. Now, hang on a second. Which processor is limitless? Our brains or the cloud computers? (laughs) Pretty sure it's our brain. These microcomputers will help us get quick answers to complex problems and will provide the extra juice needed to come up with creative new ideas. Now, I would like to be able to solve complex problems quickly and get creative new ideas, but I'm just not convinced that this is the way to go. Elon Musk wants to connect computers to your brain so we can keep up with robots. Who's keeping up with who here? I really don't fancy trying to act like a robot. But more than that, really, I think there's a deeper issue here. Who controls a robot? Humans. I know there's artificial intelligence where robots seem to come up with their own things or do things on their own. But no matter how independent this robot seems, somebody designed it to begin with. Somebody programmed it in the first place. They say that with the help of brain implants that are directly linked to computers, humans may be able to improve their brain function or even one day download their thoughts or upload the thinking of others. 
sorry, that should be the other way around. Upload their thoughts or download the thinking of others. Do you see where this is going? I mean, it's not spelled out here, but think about the implications. Who is controlling the mind of the human? You don't need thoughts of your own. Just download somebody else's thoughts. Let someone else do your thinking for you. No thinking needed. How does that line up with this quotation from the book Christian Leadership? God has given men talents, which he means they should use. He has given them minds, and he means they should become thinkers and do their own thinking and planning. Do their own thinking and planning, not download someone else's thoughts, rather than depend upon others to think and plan for them. I don't think that lines up with uploading their thoughts and downloading the thinking of others. Now, let me clarify. I don't mean to suggest that this is the future of the world and soon everyone will be controlled by these select few that just sit there at their computers and run the population. No, I'm not suggesting that. In fact, I'm suggesting it's way worse than that. Satan has been working on mind control for a long time. And if we think cloud-based thinking is how he's going to finally control our minds, we've missed the point. This is not how he's planning to control our minds. In fact, he's already got there. He's already controlling many people's minds through many ways. And we're going to to talk about some of those this morning. How many of you have heard my talk, A Thinking Generation, Ten Tactics of Satan? Okay, several of you. Great. So this will be review for some of you, uh, but it's always good to hear it a couple times, I think. A recent study found more than 80% of employers said recent graduates were deficient in critical thinking. Has Satan already got a head start on controlling thoughts? I think so. 80% deficient in critical thinking skills. Now, psychologists tell us that less than half of us are even capable of engaging in formal reasoning. Less than half of us, even capable of it. But they also tell us that, in reality, only 5% of us actually think. (laughs) That's frightening. I mean, we don't really have to worry about cloud-based computing when we're already to this point of not thinking for ourselves. We need to ask ourselves a question, though, from a spiritual standpoint. Is this a big problem? Is this a big issue? I mean, maybe this whole somebody else controlling your thoughts isn't so bad. Is it or isn't? Well, we read that moral purity depends on right thinking. (laughs) That right there should be reason enough to say, okay, we need to be good thinkers. We need to be independent thinkers. Moral purity depends on it. Young men must be trained up to be thinkers, so moral purity depends on it. It should be part of education, evidently, if we should be training our young men to be thinkers. And God calls upon everyone with whom he works to do the very highest kind of thinking. This is almost a command. It it really is a command. Saying, God says, I created you with a brain. Why would you let someone else control your thinking for you? Be an independent thinker. But it really really boils down to, uh, as we're discussing true education this weekend, one of my favorite quotes from the book Education says, Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator. We've all been given a power like our Creator. That word akin, that's an old English word that just means like, similar to our Creator. What is this power? Well, it continues on. Individuality, power to think, and to do. And really, this is where the heart of it lies. When we talk about thinking, sometimes it's easy to get, uh, maybe you remember some person with a PhD that you know, and wow, they're just such a good thinker, such an intellectual. Intellectual is not the type of thinking that we're commanded to do. Some of us are blessed with those abilities, some of us are not. All of us, though, are given a power akin to that of our Creator individuality. That's the key to the type of thinking that we're discussing here, laying a foundation for the power of individual thought, the power to make a decision independent of what those around us say and based on the Word of God, of course. Power to think. The men in whom this power is developed are the men who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. Do we want our young people to grow up to bear responsibilities? To be leaders or followers? Leaders. To influence or to just be influenced? To influence. 
And so it is the work of true education to develop this power. What power? The power of independent thought. To train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thought. You know, when I read this quotation years ago, having been in the educational field as a teacher, I said, wow, that's exactly what has happened. We have a generation of young people, of students in our schools, who have been trained to just reflect what somebody else thought for them. When you read a textbook, study a textbook, and get an A on the test, you just got an A in reflecting someone else's thoughts. And I'm not against getting A's on tests, please understand. But... We are not training independent thinkers if all we do is teach our young people to remember some information that was fed to them and get it, get it right on a test. That's not the type of thinking we are called to do. What is the type of thinking we are called to do? You know, I mentioned earlier, Satan has been about this game of mind control for a long time. How do I know this? Well, we know it from the scriptures. He's been at this a lot longer than Elon Musk or Ray Kurzweil. <clears throat> Let's turn to Revelation, two verses that will make this very clear to us. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Okay, here comes an angel. He has God's seal. As Christians, is that good news or bad news? That's good news. We want God's seal, right? Okay, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till, read that with me, We have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. The seal of God, placed on the hand, placed on the foot, the forehead. Why? Why the forehead? The frontal lobe, that decision-making part of your brain. God says, I place my seal on that. Now, is this some stamp that the angel comes up? You have the seal of God now. No, this is symbolic, right? This means our brain, our frontal lobe, our decisions are now, they now have the seal of God. We have chosen to decide to follow God. That is what that seal of God represents. Now, is God the only one with a seal placed on our forehead? He's not. Turn over to Revelation 14, verse 9. Revelation 14, verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, where? In his forehead or in his hand. Now there is a difference here. God will not force us to follow him, and so he wants us to choose to follow him. Satan says, Yes, I want you to choose to follow me. First goes the seal onto the forehead. But if he can't get that, he'll take the hand too. He'll get our actions. He'll force us, you know, one way or another. But notice the the battle going on here. This is a battle of mind control. God says, I want you to choose to follow me. I want to have, you know, he's not going to come and force us to follow him. He's not going to control our minds, but he wants us to give our minds to him for him to control. And Satan says, yes, I also want to control your minds. And we see this all throughout the Bible. First uh, Peter 1.13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, strengthen your mind, Prepare it for the last days. Romans 12, verse 2. Actually, let's turn there. That's one of my favorites. Romans 12, verse 2. We see another comparison here of worldly mind control versus heavenly mind control. Revelation, uh, sorry, Romans 12, verse 2. Be ye not conformed to this world. What does it mean to conform to something? To be molded to it. Become like it. So don't become like the world, Paul is saying. Now, if Paul says, don't become like the world, what do you think Satan says? (laughs) Become like the world. There's two options there. We don't have any middle ground. So be not conformed to this world. Okay, great, Paul, I, I agree. I don't want to be conformed to this world. How do I avoid being conformed to this world? Well, he tells us. 
Be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't fall into mind the devil's mind control, but be transformed by having God renew our minds. It's a beautiful picture, really. But what I'm trying to really get at here is that the end time battle will be a battle for our minds. We've seen that in Revelation. The seal of God placed on our foreheads. The seal of Satan placed on our foreheads. It's one or the other. We have a choice, and the end time battle is a battle for the mind. The warfare in which we are engaged is largely mental. And that says it pretty clearly. This is a mental battle we are fighting. God knows that our young people, this is from the book Messages to Young People, they, our young people, will have to battle against the powers of darkness that strive to gain control of the human mind. The devil is about mind control. This is what he's going for. This one is even more solemn. I saw standing by the side of these neglected children, the one who is, this is talking about parental neglect in the context. If you look it up in Councils to Parents, Teachers and Students, page 204, 205, um, She's talking about parental neglect, and she says, I saw standing by the side of these neglected children the one who was cast out of the heavenly courts because he originated sin. He, the enemy of souls, was watching for opportunities to gain control of the mind of every child whose parents had not given faithful instruction in regard to Satan's snares. Does Satan wait until we're 20 and says, all right, let's start this mind control thing now? (laughs) No, he starts at birth, exactly, very, very early. It was the historian, Carter G. Woodson, as he, I think historians might know a thing or two about mind control, right? They could see how people behaved based on on who was leading them. And he says, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. Did you want that slide? (laughs) When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. Does the devil know this? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why he's going for mind control. A famous leader once said, how fortunate for leaders that men do not think. Who do you think said this? Any guesses? Adolf Hitler. How fortunate for leaders that men do not think. Now, I'm not going to get into politics this morning, but I think we may be seeing this played out again right now. It is the special work of Satan in these last days to take possession of the minds of youth. This is is serious. This is not something to just be like, yeah, you know, I think Satan's probably, you know, going after our minds. I'll be careful. I'll watch out for his deceptions. No, this is a serious warfare in which he is seeking any time a parent is neglecting the child. He's seeking, "I, I want to gain control of that mind. The earlier, the better. How's he doing it, though? That's what I want to look at for the remainder of this talk. He's not putting nanobots in our mind to help us be controlled by a computer. No, he's doing it in way more sinister ways than that. We read also in Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students that close reasoners and logical thinkers are few. And we've seen this from the research, right? What percent? About five. (laughs) Not very many. Why? For the reason that false influences have checked the development of the intellect. Now that word checked, is that writing a check? No, this is an old English word. Can anyone tell me what does this word checked mean in this context? Stopped? Controlled? Put a halt on it? Right. Uh, I think it's in, we have a, a modern term for this. My grandpa, he's a dog trainer, and he uses something called a check lead. And it's a short little rope that when he's training the dog and the dog gets out of hand, he, he checks it. He holds it back. And so that's the same thing saying here. You know, the, the development of the child is progressing. Those close reasoners, logical thinkers, that's developing. But then false influences come in and check it. They hold it back. What are these false influences? Well, there's many that we could go into. Many of them are false educational practices. As we saw that it's the work of true education to develop the power of thought. So if it's the work of true education, does Satan have a counterfeit for everything? Does he have false education? 
Of course. So if the work of true education is to develop the power of independent thought, then the work of false education would be what? To damage independent thought. To make that not develop at all. And so this morning I'd like to look at ten ways in which Satan is going about mind control. And you won't find nanobots in here. Ten thought-destroying tactics. Our first one is a lack of physical activity. Now you're saying, wait a second here. We're talking about mental development, thought. What does physical activity have to do with this? Actually, a lot. Research is now telling us that for a young child, physical activity is actually more important than time spent studying. How important? More important. Not just as important, not, yeah, you know, make sure you get a little exercise. No, it's more important. They say, literally, if you have a set number of hours in the day and you don't have time to do the schoolwork and go outside, just go outside. They'll learn better because of that time outside. And I could get into a lot of science behind that. You'll hear more of that throughout this weekend. But for now, just remember the research is showing that it is absolutely critical. And part of the reason for this is an area of the brain known as the cerebellum. The cerebellum is linked with higher frontal levels in the brain. Now that's a key word, frontal levels. What what, what do you think that is talking about? What part of the brain? The frontal lobe that area of the brain that helps us make decisions. The cerebellum, located way down here in the lower, down uh, down toward the brain stem, is linked with the higher frontal levels in the brain. I forget which percent, I believe it's about 40% of the brain's neurons are within this cerebellum and connected out to the other areas of the brain. Critical area of the brain. It is also linked with the ability to perform repetitive activities automatically, take handwriting, you know, most academic Um, disciplines require a good, well-developed cerebellum. It deals with many cognitive skills, language, social interaction, music, and attention. How many here have used their cerebellum this morning? Every hand should go up. (laughs) That's all of us. If if you've done any of these things, you have used your cerebellum. How many want a well-developed cerebellum? Yes, we all do. How can we do that? Very simple. Movement is absolutely necessary for the development of the cerebellum. Necessary. It is not uh, optional. If we want the cerebellum to develop well, movement is critical. Numerous studies show that movement is essential for learning, especially in children. Things like rocking. Every month, well, I mean, mothers have rocked their babies for thousands of years. That was good for the cerebellum. Crawling. Very good for the cerebellum. It's also good for the corpus callosum, the connection between the hemispheres of the brain. I'll touch more on that at another time. Spinning. Ever wondered why, you know, kids, how do they not get dizzy? Uh, There's science behind why that is. The fluid in the semicircular canals of the ear is thin and watery in childhood. They don't get dizzy as easily. God knew they would need that for cerebellar development. Hanging upside down. How many of you used to do that as a, as a child, but just, ah, it makes all the blood go to your head now, right? <laughs> it's good for them. It helps their cerebellum develop. And Dr. Jane Healy, you'll see quite a few quotes from her this weekend. Uh, she is one of the eminent educational psychologists of, her, of our day. I have a few of her books with me. I'll have on the resource table. She tells us that after birth, physical activities are one of the child's main means not a secondary means, not an optional one, the main means, one of them, of advancing physical, intellectual, and emotional growth. Now, this is interesting. From the spirit of prophecy, from the book Education, how many areas of education do we have? The physical, the mental, and the spiritual, right? From a secular standpoint, she's naming those three things, physical, intellectual, and emotional. What is necessary for them? physical activities. It doesn't say physical activities are necessary for advancing physical growth. No, it's necessary for advancing all three areas of growth. So you should encourage many forms of body movement. Now there are many forms of body movement. There are many activities that we can do. Outdoor activities are definitely the best for young children. There's fresh air, there's sunshine. Uh, it's, It's a beautiful environment that God has designed. But there's one activity that hands down beats all the rest of them, the best physical activity for mankind, really, but especially for children. Any guesses what this is? What was it? Gardening. 
You got it. It is gardening. Now, walking, yes. We also read walking is the best form of exercise. But when we're talking about a physical activity, no line of manual training is of more value than agriculture. Nothing more. Nothing is more important. Okay, point number two, overstimulation. Overstimulation, what is that? The overloading of young children with lots of toys, with many electronic devices, a tight schedule, too much school, a multitude of activities, begins to overwhelm the young mind. Pretty soon you reach a point kind of like this. (laughs) Just can't handle it. And it becomes difficult for that little brain to take it all in And pretty soon you actually begin to suppress good thinking abilities. Children need time to process things, time for reflection, time to organize the mind. Child psychologists tell us that many things that an adult may consider uh, enjoyable, maybe a, a, a busy schedule, you respond well to pressure and stress, not so good for the child. Um, that invigorating, hectic lifestyle, some of us thrive on it, uh, some of us don't. Uh, but children definitely don't. And what we found, <clears throat> and let me actually get back to these three items. The toys, too many toys. How many of you have met children with just more toys than they could ever play with, right? Uh, they actually find that the more toys that a child has, the more bored they are. The more toys, the more bored. That doesn't make any sense. Why? Well, because there's no need to focus on one thing for a longer period of time. I get tired of this toy, okay, I'll go to that toy. I get tired of that one, I'll go to that one. And they don't learn that power of focused thought because there's always something else to go on to. Schedule. This is a big thing with young children these days. You have school, and you have homework, and you have soccer, and you have swimming, and you have music, and you have on down the list, crammed into the schedule. It is not healthy. They need a much uh, more simple lifestyle. And of course, too much school too uh, hard pressure in the academic studies, especially at an early age, we'll cover more of that later again, uh, is, becomes quite stressful for the child. And so they found that an overstimulated lifestyle tends to create a stress response in the brain, the danger response, where the child literally feels afraid. They might not voice it, they might not um, consciously recognize that they're afraid, but that response is still um, released in the brain. Overactivity, frustration, irritability, and superficial thinking, all a result of overstimulation. If you, and you may say, well, how do I know if my child is overstimulated? If you're noticing these things in your child, stressed, overactive, frustration, irritability, that may be an indicator. I'm not saying those are the only things that can indicate. Uh, I mean, the, I'm not saying that overstimulation is the only thing that causes these things, but it definitely can indicate that the child has an overstimulated lifestyle. And of course, we see this in the educational environment. Uh, Elizabeth Walling put it quite well when she said, the bell will ring just when they're engulfed in learning about the solar system to tell them it's time to start learning how to dissect a sentence. A child learns that no subject is truly meaningful or interesting and therefore learns not to be truly interested in anything meaningful. Sound familiar? Parents should guide and work with their children through the activities, not moving on quickly and pressing them to do one thing after another. Allow them that chance to explore at a natural pace. And as you do this, there's beautiful opportunities for what's called incidental learning. How many of you have had your child learn something from a mud puddle? (laughs) It happens, a few of you. There's plenty to learn just by exploring in the great outdoors and sometimes indoors. I love the example here from Dr. Healy. She was observing, and she said, another youngster was busy constructing some mental schemas about number. He lined up eight blocks in a row and counted them in one direction, then backward to see if they were the same. Then he stacked them up into a tower and counted them again, up and down. Convinced that eight is eight from all directions, he skipped off. Unaware, he had just mastered an abstract mathematical idea. Now, there are two ways that this child could have been taught this. He could have sat them down with a book, and the the math textbook, and taught them, quotes, (laughs) this concept, this abstract mathematical idea. Or you could let him learn it on his own in a much more realistic, tangible, understandable way. Uh, Incidental learning is a powerful way for children to learn. When it comes to overstimulation, there are two quotes here that make it very clear to us. Dr. Raymond Moore 
one of the eminent educational researchers of the past century, said quietness, calmness, and freedom from what kind of excitement? Artificial excitement. Build strength in the immature child. I'm sure we could all think of artificial excitement that is in our lives now. Now, he didn't come up with this on his own, I think. He probably came with it from the book Child Guidance. The more quiet and simple the life of the child, the more free from artificial excitement. And the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable it is to physical and mental vigor and spiritual strength. Quiet and simple. We as a society, at least in this country, do not live quiet and simple lives, as a general rule. And so what may seem quiet and simple to us might not be quiet and simple of, say, 100 years ago. And so we need to think about the principle here of quiet and simple, understand what is important for a child, and be careful that they are not overstimulated. You know, I've spent some time in Africa, in Tanzania. The children there, are, are they're just beautiful. They have this quiet... Um, Quiet and simple. That's how their lives are led. Free from artificial excitement. And they are happy with the simplest toys. Beautifully happy. Way more happy than I've seen a child here in the United States when he just got a new iPad. Far happier than that. Um, there, there's a beauty in the quiet and simple life. <clears throat> Too much study. This is another of Satan's thought-destroying tactics. Another tactic of mind control. Is study a good thing? Of course it is. We all need to study. But can we have too much of a good thing? Can it be intemperate? Yes, definitely. Sorry, that slide (laughs) has a typo. That should be too much study there, not overstimulation. Too much study is linked to learned helplessness. The child reaches a point, the study has become so overwhelming to their young mind that they just think, I can't handle this. And it's often a subconscious response where they soon believe that they can't learn. Shutting off. Uh, again, linked to learned helplessness, they reach a point where they are just done with it. Superficial learning, they just have to get through the material. It's not about learning the concepts and understanding it well. And of course, burnout. Many illnesses and many learning disabilities are linked to just too much study, just too much time in the books. We need study. Children need study at the right age. I'll cover more of that in another session. It is important that we do it at the right age, but Even when they are able and of a good age to be studying, we need to be careful not to have too much. We need to balance the physical, the mental, and the spiritual education. Point number four, testing. How many of you have taken a test? (laughs) Only a few of you. (laughs) I think most of us are somewhat experienced with testing, right? You at least had to get your driver's license. Is testing good for learning in the academic environment? Unfortunately, it's not. It can help teachers assess, some, to, to some extent, what a child is learning, but really it's not good for learning. A great illustration of this comes from a story, a parable, of the animals. For a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Who's going to get an A in this test? The monkey. And everyone else is going to flunk, right? Maybe the bird, he could fly up there. He's not not going to climb it. The story goes that once upon a time, the animals decided they needed to do something to meet the demands of the new world. So they organized a school. They adopted an activity curriculum that consisted of running, four subjects, running, climbing, swimming, and flying. Those are definitely animal subjects. So... All the animals were quite excited about this new school. They were highly motivated. They wanted to get good grades, so they tried very, very hard. Well, the duck was excellent in swimming and flying. In fact, he was better than his instructor. But he lagged behind his classmates in running and climbing, so he had to stay after school and also drop swimming in order to practice those two subjects. Soon his webbed feet were badly worn from running that he was only average in swimming. But average was acceptable in school, so nobody worried about that except the duck. At the start of the year, the squirrel was first in his class in climbing and in running, and second only to the duck at flying. But he developed serious frustration issues in the flying class because his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of the treetop down. 
He developed Charlie horses from overexertion and caught pneumonia in swimming class. So he missed so much school that he got a C in climbing and a D in running. To make matters even worse, because the squirrel constantly squirmed and chattered in class and had difficulty paying attention, he was diagnosed with a learning disorder. The squirrel eventually was placed in remedial classes and had to be medicated in order to continue his schoolwork. The rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but had a nervous breakdown because of so much makeup work in swimming. The fox was a natural in his running class and scored well in climbing and in swimming, but became so frustrated at his inability to get good grades in flying that he began assaulting his classmates. He even tried to eat the duck. His behavior was so disruptive, he was expelled from school, he fell in with a rough crowd, and eventually wound up in a center for animal delinquents. The eagle was a problem child and was disciplined severely. In the climbing class, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but he insisted on using his own way to get there. The elephant, meanwhile, developed low self-esteem because he couldn't do well in any of the subjects. When he sank into clinical depression, his therapist persuaded him to try a different school that focused on subjects such as lifting and carrying. The elephant was disappointed because careers in lifting and carrying were not as prestigious as careers in climbing or swimming or flying or running. Even though he always felt inferior, he did manage to make a decent living and support his family. At the end of the year, an abnormal eel that could swim exceedingly well and also run, climb, and fly just a little had the highest average and was valedictorian. The prairie dogs stayed out of school and fought the tax levy because the administration would not add digging and burrowing to the curriculum. <laughs> they apprenticed their children to a badger and later joined the groundhogs and gophers to start a successful homeschool group. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a funny story. A parable, obviously no such thing ever happened. But do you see the parallels? Do you see the serious side of this? This is crazy, you say. Well, I mean, that would never happen. Are we guilty of the same thing in education? Expecting children to learn exactly the same way, take the same test, standardize everything? That is just not even common sense. It's Dr. David Elkind. He wrote a fantastic book. I don't agree with everything in it, but the premise of his book was great. The Hurried Child. He's a PhD in child development from Tufts University. He says that the factory model of education, this model where everything is standardized, ignores the individual differences in mental abilities and learning rates and learning styles. Children are pressured to meet uniform standards as measured by the standardized tests. Those who cannot keep up in the system, as indicated by the test, are often regarded as defective vessels and are labeled learning disabled or ADHD. Schools have become increasingly industrialized and product-oriented. Teachers are unionized, textbooks are standardized on a national level, and testing has become mechanized and all-pervasive as a consequence. Education is reforming, which means more basics, more hours, more homework, more testing, more of everything that's creating the problem. It's a classic case of the cure being worse than the disease. He's saying, look, everything we're doing to try to fix our problems in education, they're the ones that cause the problems to begin with. And so as he puts it very, very clearly, under these circumstances, children discover very quickly that passing tests rather than meaningful learning is what school is all about. How many of you can relate to this? How many of you have been through this school environment? I mean, I think to my college years, I would study like crazy the day before because I had that test in the morning. I'd get an A on my test in the morning. And a couple hours later, I didn't remember anything about that test because I'd move on to the next one. I had learned very quickly. And I got a 4.0 in college. You may have said, oh, that's a great student. I wasn't a great student. I just learned how to take tests really well. There's no time or space to develop the deep understanding of concepts to test out new ideas through verbal and written action, or de develop deductive reasoning skills. There's those reasoning skills again. There's no time or space for this. There is no independent thinking needed to memorize something for a test. The memorizing necessary for these tests is a linear process that does not require entire brain use. 
Rote memory is a straight line process requiring none of the depth of understanding that comes from whole brain activation. In short, rote memory does not require thinking. We're trying to encourage thinking in children, and here we're giving them something that doesn't even require them to think. And so it was Doris Fromberg, director of early childhood ed- teacher education at Hofstra University, says there's no evidence that standardized tests make a difference in learning. We've been doing this long enough. We should have some evidence now that points us to whether they're beneficial or not. We do have evidence, and it's saying they're not beneficial. There is no evidence that standardized tests make a difference in learning. So who is benefiting from the testing? If it's not the children, well, the large corporations and publishing companies. Because they write the textbooks, and they write the tests that go along with them. These are not my words. I'm not trying to point fingers here. This is Director of Early Childhood Teacher Education at Hofstra University saying, it's not benefiting our kids. The only ones benefiting are the ones who we're buying these tests and textbooks from. And I do want to clarify, it's not just standardized tests. It's the testing environment where a child learns something well enough to put it down on a test. A test, again, it just doesn't measure learning very well. In real life, how do we know when you've accomplished... uh, When Let me say it this way. In real life, how do we know when you've learned something well? You can teach someone else. else. Excellent. How else? You can do it. Right. You can do it yourself, and you can teach someone else how to do it. Not you can write it down on a test. That's a poor... It might indicate some things. Yes. I I mean, I'm not saying that tests don't show anything, but they're not proving that a child has learned something. Okay, enough on testing. Let's move on to point number five, mind control, Satan's thought-destroying tactics, poor health and nutrition. We could spend a lot of time on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think we all understand how our diet impacts our frontal lobe. And there are so many even so-called health foods now that are actually more damaging to our frontal lobe than often not so health foods. You know, a lot of the chemicals and things now. Good food is important for good thought. It's now believed that myelin, which is an essential component to brain development cover more of that in a later session, is made up of many things found in a healthy diet, particularly essential fatty acids found in breast milk, incidentally. Breast is absolutely best for the infants, helps their brains myelinate. A study of one million students in New York, one million students, that's a very large study, and they they had a, a group of these students who ate lunches that did not include artificial flavors preservatives, and dyes. They didn't really change the diet a whole lot. They just pulled out foods that had artificial flavors, preservatives, and dyes. Those students did 14% better on IQ tests. That's a big jump in IQ tests, 14% better. Satan has definitely had his hand in designing the poor diet so common in, well, in, in all, I almost said in children today, that's in, in most of us today. And he knows that he will have a chance at damaging their mind, controlling their mind through the attack on the frontal lobe. Point number six, age segregation. I love that this conference is a family conference. We are here together learning as parents and children. That is how it should be. This concept of age segregation, where we place our children in different classes according to their age, is, first of all, new. This is not something that's been around for a long time. This is a relatively new concept. And secondly, it is definitely not helping them learn or develop very well. Jay Fieldman and Dr. Peter Gray, some very good researchers in this field of age integration, segregation today, tell us that the placement of children in separate classes with others of the same age is a fairly recent phenomenon. Age segregation did not occur in full force until the 1930s. With the, when the advent of compulsory education laws brought a large influx of children to the public school system. They had a bunch of kids. We've got to organize them somehow. How do we do it? Age. Age sounds good. That's basically the way it went. Until then, the main source of formal education for most children was the one-room schoolhouse, which on average contained approximately 25 children ranging in age from 5 to 15. How many of you attended a one-room schoolhouse when you were younger? All right, a few of you. How many of you have children currently attending a one-room schoolhouse? 
Aha, I see some homeschoolers. Good. <laughs> if you're homeschooling, that is a one-room schoolhouse. It is not limited to ages 5 to 15. It can be age 0.5 to 99, <laughs> any age. The, the infants up to the grandparents, that is true age integration. God created the family, right? He did not create families all the same age. No, it's a wide range of ages, and that's how he designed it to work best. Never in history until the 20th century have young people been largely separated from the ongoing and productive activities of society. This is the first century in history where we have taken children out of the normal learning environment of the family and put them in this age-segregated environment, separating them from the ongoing, uh, sorry, ongoing and productive activities of society. Society's survival depends on raising new generations in close proximity with adults who are engaged in their central roles. Institutional age segregation creates a situation in which parents' productive work, indeed major portions of their adult lives, are, not, are, sorry, are carried out in settings where there are no children. Children do not get to know a variety of adults and observe their lives. And as Dan Greenberg, who founded the Sudbury Valley School, an age-integrated school, sort of an experimental school, uh, which is turning out quite well. He says, does such division take place naturally anywhere? In industry, do all 21-year-old laborers work separately from 20-year-olds or 23-year-olds? In business, are there separate rooms for 30-year-old executives and 31-year-old executives? Is anything more socially damaging than segregating children by year for 14 or often 18 years? Notice what kind of damage he names. Socially. What is the number one argument given in favor of age segregation? Social development, right? Kids have to, how many times have you heard, kids have to be with other kids the same age for proper socialization? We've heard it countless times. And Dan Greenberg is saying, no, that's not socially beneficial, that's socially damaging. I'll explain more of that in a minute. But let's first understand something known as the zone of proximal development. This was, developed, this was a concept coined by the Russian developmental psychologist Lev Vygotsky. The zone of proximal development is defined as a task that occurs, sorry, a task that a child can accomplish only with some assistance and support. Most cognitive development takes place in this zone. And children develop primarily by attempting tasks they can accomplish only in collaboration with a more competent individual. That last point is really the best definition of what the zone of proximal development is. It's a, an environment where a child is taking on a task which they can only accomplish with a more competent individual helping them. A great illustration of this would be, say, a game of ball. Have any of you ever seen a couple of three-year-olds playing a game of catch. You're chuckling. <laughs> How long did that game of catch last between two three-year-olds? Not very long, right? Neither of them are coordinated enough to play this game of catch very well. Suppose, though, we took a, a three-year-old and an adult, or even a three-year-old and a ten-year-old, just an older, more well-developed, or more developed child. Well, is the game of catch now possible? Absolutely. That three-year-old makes a wild throw because he doesn't have the coordination. The 10-year-old runs over there and grabs it. And when the 10-year-old throws it back, he coaches the little one to hold his arms out just right and helps him catch it. That's that zone of proximal development. That game of catch was only possible for that three-year-old to accomplish in collaboration with a more competent individual. And you may say, well, isn't that school? I mean, they're in collaboration with the competent teacher. Collaboration and instruction are a little different. Sitting there listening to instruction being delivered is far different than actual collaboration and working together. The zone of proximal development is speaking of the real working together environment. Studies have found many, a lot of research has been done on age integration, uh, a family sort of environment or even just age mixed schools, academic environments, and they find benefits in the area of academics in the area of self-esteem. Now, we don't really understand, oh, why is that better for self-esteem? I have to think it probably has a lot to do with the peer uh, influence. Peers are often not very good for your self-esteem. Um, so I think that that is probably one of the connections there. And socialization skills. Better socialization skills in an age-integrated environment. 
this flies in the face of myths today, but it really is a myth. It is not supported by research to say that a child needs children of their own age for proper socialization. Dr. Larry Shires has done extensive research on age integration, and he says that the results seem to show that a child's social development depends more on adult contact and less on contact with other children, as previously thought. In other words, he's saying, yeah, we used to think kids had to be with kids, they're same age for proper socialization. That's not true anymore, he says. We now know that we were wrong about that. It depends more on adult contact. As Peter Gray explains it well, when you're little and just with kids your own age, the range of possible activities is restricted by the knowledge and abilities of those in your age group. But in collaboration with older kids, there is almost no limit to what you might do. A close study of what big people were up to was always the most exciting occupation of youth. Wasn't it? Isn't this the way it used to be? As a kid, you couldn't wait to go see what maybe grandpa was doing on the farm or at least get back home and see what dad was doing that afternoon. That was how it used to be. The most exciting occupation of youth. And unfortunately, we are losing that. God is really a lover of diversity. He created the family a diverse environment of personalities, thoughts, minds, understandings, and, of course, a difference, a diversity in ages. And that is the ideal environment he has created. You know, as a good friend of mine said one time, an educator himself, and he said, you know, we worry about children being prepared for the real world, for real life, He said, where do you learn how to be adults? Do you learn from other children or from adults? And I had to sit and scratch my head for a minute. I was like, yeah, you're right. Children learn how to be adults from other children. We're not preparing children to remain children for the rest of their lives, right? Right? (laughs) We don't want them to stay that way. And so if we want to prepare them to be adults, they need some adult interaction, Point number seven, I'm going to just go over this briefly because we're going to have an entire session devoted to this. uh, Is it this evening? Tomorrow morning? I can't remember. I have to look at the schedule. Television and electronics. A lot of attention has been given to the dangers of TV and electronics, uh, especially the bad content in the media. Now, I hope we all here, though, don't want children looking at bad content. Right? We're Christian parents here. We don't want them watching bad content. But what about just the media environment in general? Not bad content, good content. Is that good for their brain? We're finding out that television and electronics are actually damaging good thinking abilities. They are, part of the reason for it is that they are actually starving children, per se, of essential brain development. They're not getting that interactive, hands-on development environment that they need. We're just sitting them in front of the screen. Much of the early development of physical and mental skills, again from Dr. Jane Healy, and of their foundation in the brain, comes from experimenting and solving problems with what kind of materials? Real-world materials. Is this real world? It is our world, yes, (laughs) but it is not real world. It is not what children need to develop well. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through a list. We'll cover these in more detail in another session. Dr. Healy says that it overstimulates children. and cre- We have already learned about overstimulation, right? That's not a good thing. Television and electronics, electro- electronics of all kinds. We're not just focusing on TV. Overstimulates children and creates passive withdrawal. It causes attention and listening problems. It emphasizes skills which do not transfer well to reading or listening. It requires less mental effort than reading. It shortens the time children are willing to spend on finding an answer to intellectual problems they are set to solve. It artificially manipulates the brain into paying attention by violating certain of its natural defenses with frequent visual and auditory changes. It induces neural passivity and reduces the brain's ability to remain actively focused on a task and has a hypnotic And she says, possibly neurologically addictive. This book was written 15 years ago. We know it positively is neurologically addictive. Effect on the brain by changing the frequency of its electrical impulses in ways that block active mental processing. If a little of this was overwhelming, we'll explain it more in a later session. I'm running out. What time are we supposed to end? 
What's the schedule say? What time should this? 9.15. All right, 9.14. We are right on time. <laughs> Research is often slow in coming. And so, you know, a few years ago, we heard a lot about how TV was bad. And I don't know how many parents I've talked to that said, yeah, we got rid of TV, definitely. But we're replacing that with an, another form of TV, really. Computers, iPods, iPads, smartphones, they all fall into the same category. The American Academy of Pediatrics, ah, unfortunately, they actually just changed their recommendation. They have recommended for years, age three, no screen time until age three. They have succumbed, along with Dr. Dimitri Christakis, to social pressures. They've, they, basically, the statement that I read from them is, technology is just everywhere now. You can't get away from it. So just try not to have too much. <laughs> But that's not research-based. The research really shows keep it away from children until age three. But that was very conservative. M many more researchers say that uh, age seven, age eight. One researcher wrote an article recently that said age 12. Keep it away from kids until age 12. It is not good for their brains. And again, we go right back to what we read a, m a moment ago. The more quiet and simple the life of the child, the more free from artificial excitement. Smartphones are quite artificial, aren't they? The more in harmony with nature, the more favorable it is to physical and mental vigor and spiritual strength. You may remember if you were here last year, I did a session called I Child. I was preparing to produce a DVD series, a three-part DVD series called I Child. That is now out and available. I have it on the resource table. Three parts, three one-hour sessions, really uncovering the effects of media on children. Not bad content media, we're looking at media itself, the way it interacts with the brain, how it affects them. A, a lot of research that I don't have time to get into right now because it's 9.15, so let's cover these last two points really quickly. Point number eight, an education chiefly of the mind. We know that we need to have an education that focuses on the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. But where does education now typically focus? The mind, just the mind, just the mental overall. Yeah, we might have PE, uh, very little spiritual training though. It's not a well-balanced and harmonious development of physical, mental, and spiritual. And it's a rather ironic reality that an education focusing purely on mental culture soon causes the mind to lose its ability for whole brain thinking. A maybe somewhat imperfect analogy, but one that should help us understand it a little better. It's as if your brain was a muscle, and whole brain thinking requires all the muscles of your brain. But if you're just working one muscle all the time, how many of you have broken a limb? Any of you? Okay, a few of you. What did that limb look like after a little while of no use? Shriveled up. I can relate. This thigh here has gotten about the size of my arm, I think, because it's been six months that I haven't put any weight on it. I'm not using those muscles. This right thigh is working great. But if I want to do whole, let's say whole brain walking, suppose I went to the surgeon next week and he says, hey, it's, going, it's doing great, go ahead, start walking. What would happen if I tried to put weight on that leg? I'd go right over. There's no muscle there that would hold me up. Same thing with the brain. If we're just focusing on mental culture only, we're causing those other muscles to sort of atrophy. And so we need to be um, helping all those three areas, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual, to develop. We're told in the book Education that an education derived chiefly from books. Are books wrong? Does this say an education derived from books? No, an education derived chiefly from books. Books are great. But if that's all we're getting the education from, it leads to superficial thinking. What else do we need? Well, practical work. It encourages close observation and independent thought. Rightly performed, it, it tends to develop that practical wisdom which we call common sense. Very uncommon now. It develops the ability to plan and execute, strengthens courage and perseverance, and calls for the exercise of tact and skill. Point number nine, a lack of training to think just quickly here. We need to allow children to figure things out, problem solve for themselves, not by themselves, be with them, helping them, encouraging. Remember the, the zone of proximal development. They need that competent individual to help them, but allow them to figure it out for themselves. Let them learn by exploring and allow them to make minor mistakes. 
we all have had experience learning from the school of hard knocks. It's often a very good teacher. Some minor mistakes are good for children. Tactic number 10. I'm not going to give it away right now. It causes an inability to think formally, a disorganization of the brain, learned helplessness, learning disabilities, eye problems, school burnout, school dropout, a lack of spirituality, a major cause of our young people leaving the church, and a major cause of a lack of thinking skills. What is tactic number 10? I will tell you Friday morning. For now, let's close up with a couple of thoughts here. We're looking at mind control. Remember we saw about the neglected children, how Satan is standing there waiting to gain control of their minds. Do you think he might be using a few of these tactics, these ten to nine so far tactics that we've discussed this morning? Absolutely. I think you probably can recognize that every one of the things we've discussed this morning is normal. I mean, this is just how it operates now today, but it's definitely working to gain control of their mind. The position of a parent is one of the most responsible on earth, yet it is far too lightly regarded by the majority of the world. The future of the rising generation is in the hands of parents, for in a great measure they hold within their control the destiny of their children for both time and eternity. The salvation of the young, the what of the young? Salvation of the young. This is not their college success. This is their salvation depends almost wholly upon the training they receive in childhood. Do you think Satan is going to work against this as hard as he possibly can? And he is. Has Satan's determination to prevent this rising generation become crystal clear this morning? I hope so, and I'm sure we're going to see many more things over this weekend that will illustrate this even more. Remember, we discussed at the beginning, why are we still here? It's because we're still lacking this generation of independent thinkers. It's because we've allowed Satan to get a head start on us, to plant his, his uh, devilish nanobots, if you will, in our minds, capture our thinking. We must not allow, allow this to happen in this generation. Never before was there so much at stake. Never were the results so mighty depending upon a generation as upon these now coming upon the stage of action. How will we get this generation? With our youth immersed in this world of mind-destroying tactics, how will it happen? It will take parents. It's easy to point fingers and say, yeah, schools are doing so bad. Great talk this morning. But Jesus expects us to make a decision. We can't control the way schools run, but we can control the way our family runs. We can control the influences that our children have, no matter how weird it may be. We're not weird if we're on God's side. Is is the future in human computers, in cloud-based computing? Well, that might be something that humankind toys with, but real mind control is already at work, starting with our children. So it's up to us to decide to be part of a thinking generation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you've given us insights into what the devil's up to, into how he's attacking our families, how he's attacking our children. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless each family here, help them to recognize um, something this morning that they can take home and, and that will be a blessing to them and that will be a blessing to their children and will work for their salvation. Thank you again for this day and the many things we have to do and learn, and we ask your blessing upon it. For it's in Jesus' name, amen.